Um, this talk is GPL version 3 and Debian, and your lovely presenter here is Don Armstrong. Okay, um, thank you. So um, what I'm planning on talking about today is giving you guys a brief introduction for the first hmm, 30 or 40 minutes or so uh, about the GPL version 3, the, actually, let me rephrase that, the current draft of the GPL version 3. Um, in about one month's time, there will actually be a second draft being published. Uh, our deadline was last night for getting in revisions, and I'll explain how that works uh, in the process of the talk today. Um, so everything, though, that I'm saying is in reference to the current draft. The current draft is not going to be exactly like the final draft, uh, which will be published in about seven months' time. Um, of course, at any time during my talk today, please feel free to interrupt and ask me questions, badger me, uh, call me an idiot. That's fine. I don't mind. Idiots! Uh, thank you. <laughs> it feels like Debian legal already. Um, so let's see if we can get going here. Um, so this is just a brief overline of where I'm going. Um, so I'm going to introduce stuff which I've just done. I'll talk a little bit about the draft itself and the community review process. So how that works, uh, what your guys' job is in reviewing GPL version 3, what my job is, what the FSF's job is, what Richard Stallman's job is, um, so you guys kind of have an idea of what's going on there. I'll talk a little bit about the current draft, some of the major things that I've seen in the draft that have changed that I think are interesting. Then I will talk about some of the issues with the current draft, um, some of the problems that other people have have that I don't have, some of the problems that I have had that other people may not have, um, and some problems that probably none of us have because we don't own them, but uh, I'll talk about them anyway. Um, and then I'll conclude, and if at any point you actually want to see the exact text of a specific section of the GPL um, in this slide, one of the reasons why this talk has like 130 slides is because the actual text is in here. Um, so we can actually go to the text if you want to see it. Um, so just again, stop and let me know and I'll be glad to show it to you. Uh, so first off, again, this is a kind of historic process. This is the first time in 10 years or so that the GPL is being revised. Um, for people like me, I actually haven't been involved in free software um, since uh, for almost that long. So um, it's actually a, a really uh, important time. Um, the license is probably not going to be changed uh, for the foreseeable future. Well, hopefully will not be changed for the foreseeable future because it's an incredible amount of work to do. Um, so in this brief period of time, I hope you guys are all taking part. Um, and so the changes to this license are going to affect a lot of software in Debian that is currently under the GPL. A lot of software in Debian is currently licensed under GPL version 2 or later. Um, and so it's quite likely that some of these works are going to transition to being licensed under GPL version 3 or later, and some others like the kernel may just stay at GPL version 2. Um, so what actually gets into version 3 is going to affect the works that are present in Debian, their compatibility with other software works, what they can link with, where you can copy code from and to. Um, so all that is going to play an important part. Obviously, it also affects the free software community in general because, uh, as some people have noted, the GPL version 2 uh, and the GPL in general is really kind of a constitution or a microcosm of the statements of the free software community. Um, granted, it is a license. It has legal goals that it has to attain. But a lot of the things that are enshrined in it, the freedoms that it tries to protect, are freedoms that the free software community in general feels are very important. Um, I mean, a lot of the freedoms in there are also preserved in our Debian free software guidelines. Uh, so it's an important part of the free software community in general. Uh, I've already told you that it's important to Debian, so you know that. Um, and so, again, I'm going to talk about the process behind the license, uh, review some of the changes, and then the issues that I've picked up in the license. So there are three major components to the review of the license. There's the community. You guys are the community, okay? Everybody is the community. RMS is the community, I'm the community, you're the community, okay? We all are the community. So everybody who's in here who thinks about free software, programs with free software, uses free software, wishes they use free software, you're part of the community, and so you need to pay attention to this section. 
The next group are the committees. Um, I'm actually on a committee. Uh, there are four people who are involved in Debian on committees, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what the job of the committees are. Committees basically are effectively glorified secretaries. We have no power. Our job is just to analyze what the community says and do stuff with it, and I'll explain how that kind of works. Uh, the third prong of this uh, license job is Richard M. Stallman. So his job is to take the input of the community as filtered by the committees um, and then make changes to the current draft of the GPL and to come up with new drafts of the GPL. Um, so his job is to make decisions based on the input provided by the committees. And I'll talk a little bit too about how that's going to work. So I've said you guys at the committee. So your job, uh, and hopefully some of you have availed yourself of this, is to make comments on the current draft of the GPL. So if you go to GPL version 3.fsf.org, and I'd actually have showed you it right now, but uh, because wireless is down, uh, I can't quite do that for you. Um, if you go to GPL v3.fsf.org, you can actually make comments on the current draft of the GPL. So you can select the text that you think is wrong, uh, or is really cool, or has something that's kind of unfamiliar to you about it. You can type in a quick comment, and it goes out, and hopefully community or committees are able to check it. I personally have an RSS to email feed that takes all the comments that get made, sends them to me in an email, so I can actually view them since I'm not much a fan of websites. Uh, but uh, hopefully the committees are checking them out. So your job, again, is to make comments on the draft. In your comments, if you see problems, okay, or if you find problems that other people have identified, some of which I'm going to talk about today, if you think of good suggestions or ways of fixing these problems, okay, you should uh, file your comment and indicate that you've got a suggested change to the language of the GPL such that it actually fixes the problem, or at least comes close to fixing the problem. Um, so you don't need to be an attorney to do that. Your work, of course, will be checked by people who are attorneys. Um, so you don't need to worry too much about whether it's legal or not to do it. Um, just go ahead and make a suggested change that preserves your freedom as users. Um, and again, we're also asking, the committees are asking selected individuals who are experts in certain domains to advise the committees. So attorneys who are experts in certain areas of law, we've been asking them to uh, advise the committees. Of course, attorneys who aren't on committees, well, actually all attorneys who are involved in free software are also part of the community. Um, so they're an important part of this process as well. Um, also, people who are expert, for example, in DRM, um, authentication, and also developers who use free software are also expert in domains and, and the ways in which they use free software. Um, so in specific instances, we've been asking for uh, directed help from people in the community on the committees. So there are currently uh, five committees. So the first committee is made up of distributions. Uh, so we have two people on this committee. Uh, Brandon Robinson is representing Debian, and Greg Pomerantz, I don't know if he has actually made it yet. Uh, so I, I had hoped originally to have this more of a round table and to have Greg and uh, Brandon here, as well as Benjamin Mako Hill uh, with me as well, so I didn't have to talk to you all day. Um, you, and we could argue amongst ourselves. But um, so both Brandon and Greg are on the distributions committee. Um, the committees aren't, this is sort of the original uh, way in which they were organized. Uh, they actually have cryptic names like Committee A, Committee B, Committee C, Committee D. Um, but effectively, I, I've told you what the general makeup of these committees is as I see it. Um, so there are other free software distributions here and major projects as well are in this group. Um, uh, the second group is really the projects. Uh, so some of the smaller free software projects are there. The third group has the companies. Uh, so these are the large companies like Hewlett Packard, Intel, Sun, who have a vested interest in uh, what free software is doing. Um, so they have interesting meetings and they have attorneys that they've appointed to sit on this committee. Uh, so it's kind of interesting actually to sit in and listen to Evan Moglin explain to the corporate lawyers exactly how free software works and why it's important and what they should be doing. Uh, the fourth committee is the committee which I and Mako are on, or Mako and I actually. Um, 
And so this is the randoms as uh, Evan, well, I like to call it, I'm not sure if Evan has uh, called us that, but it's basically people who are involved in free software who for whatever reason uh, appear to be heavily involved in licensing and free software legal issues. Um, so uh, I was asked to join that committee as well as MAKO. So we've been involved um, in that particular committee. So we actually have four people again in Debian who are on these committees. The fifth committee, I'm actually not sure if we have anybody in Debian on it, um, I haven't quite figured that out yet, uh, is the International Committee. So because the first conference where these committees were set up was, uh, took place in Boston, there's necessarily a US oriented tilt to the committees. So while there were quite a few international people on each of these committees and the FSF tried as hard as it could to bring international people, uh, it's definitely not as wide ranging as it should be. And of course, the GPL is an international free software license. It's not a license only for the United States or only for North America or only for countries that have a legal system that allows them to understand English. Uh, free software is universal and so we need a license that can scale and be universal as well. And so we need people who are expert in different law systems or are members of different communities around the world to help in the process. Um, so our job as committee members is to identify issues from comments. So all the issues I'm going to point out to you today are actually comments. So if you go to my subversion server, it's svn.donarmstrong.com slash don slash trunk, or sorry, yeah, slash don slash trunk slash project slash gplb3 slash issue underscore mailboxes, you can actually see all the issues that I think are important in the comments that I've separated out into mailboxes. Um, so what we do is we get comments in, I stick them into mailboxes, other committee members do whatever they do, and if we think an issue is interesting or important, then we bring it to our meetings and we say, hey, okay, this part of the GPL, a bunch of people are saying that there's a problem. I think I agree with them. There seems to be an issue. It's not clear. I don't like what the GPL version 3 says. Uh, it conflicts with the DFSG. Uh, Evan was an idiot when he allowed this. I was an idiot when I read it, something like that. Um, so when we identify those issues, then we bring them and we, our job then is to take those issues uh, and make recommendations based upon them. So, so we take your comments, uh, steward them, massage them, make sure that your comments cover as much of the area of the issue as possible, um, and then hopefully make recommendations based on those comments uh, for changes in the GPL, or at least help uh, Richard understand the full concept of the problem. So, I mean, he's normally a fairly um, open to other opinions, but he needs to be explained exactly what the full scope of the problem is. He can make an appropriate decision only when we've explained exactly what all the minute usage cases are. So that's really our job, is to make the best case for all the different sub-problems are so that whatever the final decision he makes is, it's made with a full understanding of the whole scope of the problem. Um, okay, so Richard Stallman, as you know, is of course responsible for both version one and version two of the GPL. He's also responsible in collaboration with uh, the council at the FSF, Evan Moglin, for the original draft of the GPL version three. He'll actually be responsible for all the drafts uh, as well in collaboration with Evan um, in the GPL v3 revision process. So his job is to weigh uh, recommendations and the statements that the committees make and to make final determinations based upon them. So to change the license in any way that he sees fit. Um, yeah, and again, change the license for the next draft. Okay, so enough of talking about the process. So are there any questions about how the process works? Is anybody still awake? How many members does the committee have? Uh, yeah, so the committees are actually kind of interesting. Um, our committee has something like 12 or 15 members or something. Um, they're really flexible as to how many members they have, how they're organized. Committee D, for example, is pretty much set up in an anarchistic way. Um, we don't have any real set rules. We kind of meet in IRC when we meet. Uh, well, actually, our meetings are every Tuesday. Uh, at 2200 UTC in uh, pound committee D 
on Freenode right now. Um, so uh, that's where we meet. Anyone here is welcome to join. Uh, but yeah, the committees don't have a set number of members. There is kind of a maximal recommended number. Um, but again, the committees have been free to select their own membership uh, beyond the initial bootstrapping that was done by the Free Software Foundation. Any additional questions? Thanks. How many countries are represented in the International Committee? Yeah, actually, I'm not sure about the answer to that question because I haven't actually been paying attention. So somebody who actually knows can tell me. Uh, I'm a member of the International Committee and the uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, uh, Free Software Foundation Latin America, and the Free S Software Initiative of Japan, and the uh, other, other uh, Free Software Foundation India is a member of the uh, International Committee, uh, as I remember correctly. Excellent. So we have at least five uh, Debian individuals involved. Sorry, can I just remind people that when they're, um, when they're posing questions to please also introduce themselves because um, the people following along at home do want to know who's asking questions. Thanks. Uh, are there any additional questions about the entire process as it's laid out right now? Okay, so I'll, I'd like to move then on to talking about the current draft and exactly the issues are the things that have changed in the current draft. Um, so. There have been a couple of major changes, and I'm going to limit myself in this discussion to three of the major areas that I think have changed. Um, the first one are the DRM clauses. Uh, so these are the clauses that have actually gotten uh, Linus Torvalds uh, in quite a tizzy about the need to provide his encryption codes. Um, so we'll talk about exactly what changed, the rationale behind the changes, <coughs> and why those changes are probably a reasonably good idea. Um, and why they're worded uh, slightly suboptimally, uh, and what I've been suggesting to change about them. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk about a bit more is license compatibility. Uh, so one of the other major changes in GPL version 3 is the addition of explicit license compatibility. So I'm going to talk about those five clauses and exactly what changed to them um, and why they changed. Uh, the third one is not really much of an issue for uh, us because we don't have as many patents as some people do. Well, maybe B. Dale has to think about these sorts of things. Um, but for the majority of us, it's not a huge problem. Um, but one of the things that changed in GPL version 3 is they recognized the uh, seriousness of patents, especially software patents, in, uh, and how it affects free software. When GPL version 2 was originally written, uh, software patents were nowhere near as much a problem as they are today. Um, I mean, they were still a problem, but only a few people were aware of the scope of the problem and the serious nature of the problem that we have today. Um, and so GPL version 3 has tried to step forward and at least address this in a, as appropriate way as it can while still balancing user freedom in the balance. Um, so DRM. So the first uh, thing that was noticed is a problem called TiVoization. Um, and so the TiVo, and apparently does this, I don't actually own one, so this is all kind of hearsay. I haven't actually done all this work on it myself, um, is using hardware DRM to block modification. So TiVo uses some GPL works, and what it does is they give you the source. But if the compiled source code, or the compiled object code that you make from the source is not signed by a key controlled by TiVo, it will load the software, but it won't actually allow you to run it because it's not signed by an authenticated key controlled by TiVo. So you've got the source code, but you have no way of deploying your modifications to hardware that you actually own. Um, so it's sort of a tricky way of using the GPL against itself, uh, version two against itself, um, and blocking the ability of users to implement changes that they'd actually like to implement. Uh, we're also seeing this change happening as it occurs with trusted computing. Um, so the, again, in trusted computing, the idea, or treacherous computing as some like to call it, uh, and I don't entirely disagree with that uh, uh, characterization. Again, you've got cryptographic keys that enable um, a specific piece of software running on hardware, or even in some cases the hardware itself, to be uh, 
vouched for so that it's actually been signed by somebody. You know, this piece of software doesn't contain any back holes. Uh, it runs all the appropriate uh, compliance things. It reports everything you're doing to the appropriate authorities if you do anything illegal. Um, so they can sign all of those things and make sure that everything from your computer, the data you receive over the internet, to the sounds that you're playing, all the way as it goes to your speakers, are controlled. Of course, they haven't quite figured out yet that they can't quite control the last step of the speaker where you actually activate the sound cone, but maybe they'll go to bone phones or something so that you, they can actually have DRM all the way to your ear. Um, so that's the background of this. And so um, it's a serious problem that we saw at first in TiVo that was obvious to everybody, um, but as it goes on, it's going to become more and more of a problem. And we need to have ways of making sure that GPL software, um, no matter what hardware uh, implementations are put on top of it or other software is running alongside GPL works, that users of GPL works have the ability to modify their works and deploy those modifications. Hi, this is BDL again. Just to throw a different sort of thought in about this. Um, I'm actually not a big DRM fan personally, but I would like to point out that the TPMs and a bunch of the fundamental technology elements that are going into platforms to enable trusted computing stuff are generally useful bits of technology. And a lot of times people get wound up about the sort of worst case scenario around the trusted computing model and as a result sort of get a bad taste in their mouth for all of the bits of technology that are part of the solution. What I'd like to point out is the only reason the implementation in something like the TiVo is bad is you can't turn it off. Um, and in all of the desktops and notebooks and so forth, I think you know, being in a situation where for some usage models it's possible to turn on some or all of these behaviors is probably a reasonable technology flexibility to provide. And some of those underlying technology components like the TPM itself can be pretty handy for other things. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the risk that's trying to be addressed here is a risk that we end up in a situation where we no longer have the ability to modify the behavior of some device that we own, even if it's using GPL software. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that's one of the uh, things that, it, when we talk about the issues that I really want to make clear, is that we need to allow both uh, the cryptographic signing of keys like we do, or packages like we do in Debian, so that it's obvious that Yes, this package came from a source. Okay, the RMs or the FTP masters have vouched that yes, okay, this really is the archive. The release file has been signed uh, so that we know that those packages have come from somewhere appropriate. But on the same account, the user has to be able to say, no, I don't care what you say. I want to install this package anyway. Um, and they have to be able to do that. And so that's really the balance that has to be made. Um, and so in the issues, I'll talk a little bit more about a suggestion that we had to fix this problem in the current draft. Because the current draft actually doesn't make it clear whether it's blocking, it, it even appears to be blocking the way that Debian does its signing. Um, so it obviously wasn't the intention, but the actual language of the license is a little bit suboptimal in that area. Um, so yeah. So the major change here was that the complete corresponding source code, and you're going to hear me use that word uh, a whole lot. In fact, in this talk, it's actually an acronym for CCSC, um, so I don't actually have to type it anymore. Um, so this has been clarified to actually include uh, the codecs uh, and the codes needed to deploy the software. Um, so if you are interested in that text, it's in section one and section three, so you can see what's going on there. I have one question from uh, Norway, from School Linux, and we had a big discussion about the new uh, EU CD legislation that prevented people to use their own machines as they want to play their MP3 uh, and play their films. And in, uh, the Norwegian Consumer Authority has already looked into the issue with Microsoft Music Store, iTunes, and uh, the other music stores because breaking, almost, I, I believe, five Norwegian laws. Uh, and uh, I wonder how this would affect um, uh, GPL3 and the Debian. I call the license a kind of legislation here. How is this compatible with um, EU CD? Uh, so I'm not quite sure what the exact directive is in the EU uh, involved with the Okay. Um, so, I mean, the ability, though, to uh, actually 
control your computer and to run anything you want on it is one of the things that the GPL is trying to uh, ensure you're able to do. So any cases where it's less than clear that it's not enabling you to run anything that you want to run on your own computer, um, it's probably a bug in the license. So The, uh, the thing is that the Norwegian legislation seems to say that people should choose their own hardware as they want to. They should play MP3s, films, whatever. If you are paid for it, you choose your hardware in the private home, but you can't just copy it into the internet. That's not allowed, okay? So this is a bit tricky thing because the American interpretation of this, US is much uh, in, more in, what do you call it, uh, not in favor for, for the consumer point of view, but the European are, if you un understand this right. So it's more in accordance to the GLP, GPL3. I just tell you that's because you should probably see into what they have say, really said in EU CD directive. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, so this is one of the major uh, areas that needed to be addressed in GPL version 3. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about briefly was the different license compatibility clauses that were dropped in. Um, so most of these are fairly non-trivial, and in fact, probably everybody in this room had assumed that these licenses were effectively compatible with GPL because, I mean, uh, there's no, unless you were a lawyer and looking for various ways of suing other people, um, it, it just made sense. So the first edition, so licenses now, there's certain limited areas where other licenses that are not the GPL can be made a derivative work in combination with the GPL to work um, and have additional restrictions placed upon a GPL to work. And so there are five additional restrictions currently that are allowed to be replaced on a GPL version 3 work. This is in marked contrast from the previous uh, GPL version 2 draft in which no additional restrictions were allowed to be placed on a version 2 uh, GPL to work. So none of these things were technically allowed to be uh, blocked on a work. You could, of course, grant additional permissions. Um, and in fact, in the current version, that's been made explicit. So granting additional permissions in your copyright statement has been made explicit. Of course, nobody else has to include those additional permissions if they don't want to. Uh, but pretty much everybody who's nice does that. So I mean, it's always appropriate to remove additional permissions from a fork of a work if you don't think they're uh, reasonable. Um, and that's, again, made explicit. So the first one, again, is explicit BSD compatibility. That's 7A. Um, everybody pretty much knows what the BSD says, so that's not that exciting. Uh, oh, sorry, yes. So when I'm saying the BSD, I mean the BSD with clause 1, 2, and 4, with clause 3 removed. Okay, some kind called the uh, fixed BSD or the three clause BSD, kind of confusingly because it's really clause 3 that's removed, but uh, yes. So, yeah, I'm not talking about the four clause BSD, which is what uh, OpenSSL is licensed under. Uh, the second thing is that there's a different warranty disclaimer that has been uh, put in. Um, so you can allow slightly differing warranty disclaimers. It's one of the favorite pastimes of attorneys and lawyers to write warranty disclaimers. They love them. Um, and so odds are if you've got a license, or even people who have been influenced by warranty disclaimers like to write their own. Uh, so uh, it's allowed to have slightly differing warranty disclaimers. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, so I don't even think it really bears mentioning much. Um, the second one is kind of aimed at uh, complying or allowing uh, linking with Apache license works. So as you know, Apache license works don't allow use of specific trademark terms. The problem with Apache and to a lesser extent PHP licenses is that they uh, explicitly indicate that the word itself or the letters itself cannot be used. Um, and they don't indicate that it's not appropriate to use it outside of the scope of fair use or outside of the scope of trademark law. Um, so they're trying to use copyright law to enforce trademark, which in my mind anyway seems rather wrong. You should use the appropriate legal tool to do the appropriate legal job. Um, so, uh, but this allows you to prohibit the use of names and trademarks outside of uh, fair use uh, for publicity and such. Um, so just to point out why this is a problem, the PHP license currently disallows you from creating a derivative work 
uh, PHP called Telegraph Poll, for example, because it contains PHP in the name. So um, it's really a stupid idea, but it's what they've got, and so uh, it's probably not anything that anybody would get up in a tizzy about, but it's what the license technically says. Um, the third, or sorry, the fourth clause is actually one of the more controversial. Yeah. Are you saying that's prohibited by the GPL, or that you're allowed to prohibit that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I really don't know. So I would assume that, I mean, and again, of course, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not qualified to give legal advice in the U.S., definitely not in Mexico. So, um, <laughs> so. I would assume that this should be allowed because it seems to be fair use and it's not covered by trademark. Um, I would imagine that it wouldn't. Okay, so the question is whether or not the PHP license is actually compatible with the GPL license based on this particular clause. And that's a really thorny question. My gut feeling is that it wouldn't be, but I imagine that if you got good attorneys, they could say that it was and would argue successfully for it. So it's kind of a what we like to call a lawyer bomb. So whoever has the most expensive lawyers can uh, win out the day. So I mean, I'm not, I can't give you a clear cut answer. So it's definitely not obvious that it's compatible. Um, the fourth thing is the Afro compatibility, or Afero, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, and so as those of you who probably know, the Afero uh, GNU public license or Faro general public license, whatever the acronym actually stands for, um, contains a clause which requires you to maintain a functioning facility to provide users with complete corresponding source code upon demand. So that means that it's basically set up to be for ASP uh, setups where you've got a web application so you can click on a button and you can download the tarball or something of the source code. Um, so they've allowed explicit compatibility with this section. Um, this is actually one of the clauses, as Mako can tell you, that I'm least uh, happy about. Um, and so hopefully in the issues and roundtable part, we'll have more to talk about that. The other part is, again, uh, limited software patent retaliation compatibility uh, and limited patent retaliation. So some licenses, as you know, have brought in a uh, patent retaliation clause. Um, and so this allows compatibility with licenses that uh, revoke copyright uh, authorization and permissions based on aggressive patent suits. So by that I mean patent suits that are not retaliatory. So if I just decide to sue you, okay, claiming that the GPL work uh, violates my patents, then I lose any rights that I had to use the GPL works uh, and any of the patent grants contained therein. Um, however, it protects me if you sue me claiming that I violated your patents or something, and I sue you saying that, well, okay, that's great, but look at all these great patents that I've got. I know you're violating some of them. Um, that protects me. Of course, since most of you don't have huge patent portfolios, it's kind of a null operation. But if you're a big corporation with huge amounts of um, patents, uh, it, it starts to become a bigger concern. Of course, most bigger corporations with a lot of patents have realized by now that uh, software patents are really a serious issue and they need to do something about it, even if that means that they need to glom together with other corporations and do massive cross-licensing. Something needs to happen. Um, and so for the most part, uh, most of the corporate attorneys have been really picking away at this clause and trying to figure out how they can, this clause and another clause in the license which grants patent rights explicitly um, and how they can make it fit in with their corporate model and protect them as well as protecting you and me, uh, even in case we get sued for patent infringement or something. Uh, okay, so I talked a little bit about the Afro Clause, and I think I'm going to wait to talk more about that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk more about that in terms of the issues themselves with the license. Um, another change was the uh, in my opinion, the rather stupid geographical limitations clause where if somebody said that, okay, you're not allowed to distribute this work to such and such a country, then you couldn't distribute it to it. Uh, luckily, almost no one knows that that clause actually existed in GPL version 2 unless they read through the whole license very carefully. So no one used it. Um, and so Richard and Evelyn decided that there was no reason to have that clause anyway, and it seemed kind of stupid 
Um, so they removed it, uh, which I think was a good idea. Um, the other thing is that they've made it even more explicit in uh, GPL version 3 that it's not a contract, uh, thus forestalling one of the favorite uh, long-standing flame wars of, G of Debian legal. So <laughs> go ahead. Well, <clears throat> you just, just said, uh, my name is Andy Bard, and I'm come from Germany. Um, which is quite important for my next comment. You said at the very beginning that JPL is not a US only license, which is of course very, very true. But according to German legislation, uh, anything that grants you rights to use something is a contract. But of course you can still write that in the GPL otherwise, it's just void in German terms of speaking. And also on the other continental European law systems. So that's just a difference between common law systems like the US and the continental laws that we have in Europe. Right, and that, that's kind of a difficult question. The main reason why they didn't want to make it clear that it's not a contract is because in a lot of countries, in order to be a contract, there are a whole host of legal setups that you have to comply with. So in the case of Germany, if it has to be a contract, I suppose it will be one. Uh, it, it, of course, it, it turns around that if you don't think that it's a contract and you want to argue that it's not and therefore void, then it, it does what it's supposed to do. Then you have no rights to use the work at all. So, I mean, anybody who's going to argue that it's not valid is, is pretty much they're cutting off both feet. So, uh, yeah. So, even if that may be a valid argument, and I don't think any, anybody <laughs> will actually make it. Perhaps it might be a good idea, I don't know if it's really a good idea, but perhaps it might be a good idea to explicitly say, okay, into such common law, law system, it's not a contract. In the continental types ones, where, the, where what a contract is is basically defined by different, it is one. I don't know if it's possible and useful to do it. Right, yeah, that's a, a good point. And I, I would actually suggest that you make a comment uh, talking about that. Um, so, yeah, so the comments are basically the equivalent of bugs in the bug tracking system for the GPL version 3. Um, so, since I'm, of course, not an expert in, not even in US law, um, so that would be a, a good thing to do, is, and uh, even if you couldn't suggest language uh, on how to do that. Um, another thing that was brought in that I mentioned briefly was there's actually patent shielding now. So what that means is that if you're a big corporation and you have massive cross-licensing agreements with other corporations and you are knowingly relying upon those cross-licensing agreements in order to distribute your work. So that means that if you distribute it, those companies aren't gonna sue you because they have cross-licensing agreements. You have to act in such a manner as to shield your downstream users from those patent uh, claims. So that basically means that when you're actually uh, setting up these patent licenses that you need to do it in such a way that everybody downstream of you can distribute the work as well. Um, so it's pretty much putting the onus on the big corporations who have the ability to make these large patent cross-licensing agreements to protect you and me um, from the outfall of them. Uh, so again, the digital rights management is a, currently an open issue which we talked about. Um, the other ones are, again, treacherous computing, which we also mentioned briefly. The next one is the ASP loophole, which I'll talk about a little bit more and what I think should be done there. Um, I forget what I was talking about with section six. Oh, that's actually a change that I'm suggesting for the ASP loophole. Again, the patents. So again, not much of a problem for you and me, but a problem for big companies. And the final thing is my own little pet peeve is the fact that the GPL itself isn't free software. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about that. So yeah, so the main thing again with DRM is that we wanted to prevent TiVoization. Um, and so that's the overarching background of this entire clause. Um, so what we really need is we need the keys necessary to update the device. So if it's possible to disable the keys, that should be fine. If it's possible for the user to generate their own keys and replace the keys existing on the device, that should also be okay. Okay, so long as the device, when it's updated like that, is able to communicate with everything that it was able to communicate with before, that should be appropriate. It's also not intended that the current clause is written, as it seems to some to say, um, should require users who are encrypting stuff, for example, with GPG, intentionally, uh, to provide 
the decrypted output or their keys to anybody else who asks. Um, so it definitely wasn't intentional uh, for that to be written that way, but a lot of comments were made saying that it seemed that you had to provide your private key and the hash to unlock it uh, so that other people could read all your mail and stuff. Uh, so that was definitely not intentional. Yeah, and so it, the um, other thing that it seems to pro make you provide currently is API keys. So for example, just to pick one that I thought up when I was thinking about this, the Google API currently requires that you have some sort of key to uniquely identify you if you want to make more than about a thousand requests a day of their API. Um, so obviously, an application who uh, is writing something for the Google API uh, is not fully functional unless you have such a key. But it seems silly that the uh, maintainer of the package should have to give you their API key. Perhaps they paid for a full up license to get I don't know, whatever else a full-up license that Google gives you. Um, so if it's possible for you to get an API key uh, without paying anything additional, then you should be able to do that. Um, yeah. Andreas has, a Andreas has a question. Uh, just another question. For if you look, for example, at the Linux kernel currently, they are doing something which they said is a tainted flag. It, so if you load modules which are not provided by the original Linux kernel torball, you get tainted set, which is of course a good thing, and it's enforced by the, it's more or less enforced by the license currently. Would that be compatible with GPLvz? It's only, it's not technically protected, it's only protected to, uh, forbidden to change it currently. Right, since it's probably enforcing the license, I would imagine that it's compatible. And of course, since you've actually got the source code, you can remove all that code anyway. Um, so. I mean, it seems like you've got all the keys that you need, all the keys to the castle that you need to do it. Um, so it seems reasonable to, to enable it. Any, any questions about this? So I, I know this is really the issue that Linus Torvalds had problems with uh, in GPL version three. Um, so basically the current change that I've made, so yeah, we just had another question. Yeah, question with respect to keys, by the way, I'm Yuri Vasilevsky. Uh, is, is it enough to for there to be a way for you to work around the existing key, like disable that functionality, replace them, get you around through Google or whatever, or that should be the default case? They should be by default disabled. Um, I think it's probably enough for you to be able to trivially disable it. And by that I mean that you don't have to go in and they can't say that, oh yeah, well you can disable it by twiddling this bit in the, the file. Uh, you have to disassemble first and then reassemble. So I mean, it has to be something that you can actually disable. Um, so, But I, it doesn't have to be the default case. No, I mean, I, I, it, it could be the way currently written, it seems like that, but in my understanding, it should not be the default case because it's perfectly legitimate for a default install of Debian, for example, to have the packages being signed so that users who don't know what they're doing are aware if they're downloading from a site that's been trojaned or something. Thank you. So yeah, so that's the major change that I'm trying to make, uh, and I've actually prepared a position statement on this in the current draft. BDL has a question. And frankly, if you think about the TiVo case, it's completely legitimate for a company like that to want to ship a product where they have control over the bits that are running, particularly while the user wants to stay within the bounds of a warranty or something like that. I mean, th this is an interesting question, and it's come up before with respect to indemnification and all sorts of other, you know, sort of legal boundary case issues. Is you know, you want to provide the ability for any end user under the spirit, not just the letter of the GPL, to be able to modify, enhance, improve, and then run the stuff that they've done and share it with others and so forth. But it's also completely reasonable for a company to say, okay, but when you do that, you're not actually running the bits that we gave you anymore, so there has to be some boundary on our responsibility for you know, whether it works or not. And so I don't even have any problem if something like a TiVo wants to ship in a mode where it won't run somebody else's you know, compiled executables unless you do something explicit to turn that on and in the process have the chance to be presented with a banner that says, by the way, you're now walking outside of the bounds of 
what we as the company who produce this product know how to warrant and how to support. And I think as users, those of us who are into you know, working on our own stuff and making it better all the time would consider that a button we'd happily press and keep going. And that would completely resolve the philosophical issue in my mind. So don't think, again, that you know, there's no use or there's no value in the world for these sorts of mechanisms. We just have to have some way to turn them off and keep using the stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem, too, though, becomes difficult because one of the things that you can do with those flags is you can then take and say, hey, this thing has been modified, so now you can no longer interact with the TiVo network as you were before. So it's kind of a question whether you can, uh, disallowing warranty may be appropriate, but breaking the interoperability of your TiVo device with other TiVo devices, however that hap actually happens, based on the fact that you've modified the software. Even if you fixed a bug in TiVo and it's working better than it was before, um, is, is in my mind anyway not acceptable. So it, it's one of those things where actually writing this clause and the replacement for it um, is, is still suboptimal. Um, Seth Schoenberg uh, is continually uh, emailing me huge missives telling me exactly where uh, the my latest attempt at fixing this is fundamentally broken. And the cases where it allows people to be locked into uh, DRM or where it disallows use cases that are appropriate. Uh, and so it's really been a very difficult task to, to write um, a clause that actually works uh, in this aspect. Um, in fact, if you're actually interested in seeing my current attempt, it's the same SVN directory. It's just issues instead of issue underscore mailboxes. And you can see exactly what I've currently written on it and what I'm currently thinking about. And you can send me mail telling me that I'm, I'm doing something completely wrong, that I should be doing something else instead. That's always fun. So yeah, so this again is the major, one of the major issues with the current draft. Um, and so it's one of the things that everybody really should think about because you all use work, you're all going to be affected by DRM. Yeah. Uh, in the TiVo case, wouldn't it be appropriate for TiVo to include uh, a statement in their service agreement with a customer saying that if you use unauthorized software, we cannot provide you the service? And wouldn't that then be outside of the scope of a GPL license then? Well, the problem is, is they're using GPL works and they're using GPL works in such a way that they're basically breaking the freedom of the users to modify them. So, I mean, while they probably could do that, I don't think it would be appropriate as far as V3 is concerned because it would break the interoperability of the GPL V3 to work, e even if it, all they did was just recompile it and it was still working exactly the same. So, I mean, if they wanted to do that and it may be an appropriate business model for them, they shouldn't be using GPL that works to do so. Because, I mean, otherwise they're basically using GPL that works and piggybacking on the work of a lot of free software developers and using it to lock in their users. Uh, we have another question over here. Hi, Andrew McMillan. Um, when the uh, GPLv3 comes into effect for these situations, will that mean that uh, code that's been licensed for GPL v2 or later at your choice will um, enable people to put cases against the TiVo kind of code? Um, no. So once code has been put under v2, you could take v2 code, fork it, and say that I'm going to add bits to it that are v2 only. Um, and so it will still be possible at any point in time, assuming you've got v2 or later code, and to make it uh, just compliant with v2. So the the license um, choice there applies to the TiVo people, not to the um, ultimate recipients of the code? Uh, so the ultimate, yeah, so it, it, yeah, it's the person distributing. So the users, un unfortunately the way it works is the, the distributor has to comply with the license, not necessarily the users. Although there is an interesting case, which we'll talk about in a second, with the Afro compatibility clause that uh, it's kind of changing that notion. Um, another issue that I had is there's a section in the uh, GPL version 3 which disallows illegal invasions of users' privacy. Um, so obviously, 
Illegally invading your user's privacy is quite reprehensible. Uh, it's not something that you should be doing. But there are uh, already extant uh, criminal uh, procedures used to prosecute people who illegally invade users' privacy. Uh, of course, the only people who wouldn't be liable to be prosecuted criminally, or at least civilly, are uh, companies. Or, sorry, not companies. Governments, yes, I'm confusing the two. They seem very similar these days. Um, so, um, yeah, so governments, of course, wouldn't be, uh, would be the major people who wouldn't be being prosecuted criminally. But, of course, governments are in a unique position to be also the arbitrators of their laws in their own country. So it, it, it doesn't help to go after a country saying that you violated copyright in quite a few countries anyway. Um, because a country could just say, well, okay, that's fine, your copyright is great, but we need it in order to do X, so we hereby disavow your copyright within the limits of our country or whatever they need to do. Um, so it's kind of a clause that has a nice idea, um, but it's not particularly effective. Uh, the other problem, of course, uh, again, obvious, it has an obvious connection to the Sony DRM debacle. I'm actually not sure, since I'm not Richard M. Stallman, even though I have long hair, um, I'm not sure exactly whether he was thinking about that when he wrote this clause, but it definitely seems appropriate uh, in relationship to that whole rootkit uh, fiasco and some of the other uh, really invasive um, DRM clauses. The problem for Debian, of course, is that this clause quite clearly conflicts with DFSG section 6. And so this is the, as I like to call it, the anti-no-nuke clause. Um, so the there's a couple licenses that aren't very popular anymore because very few people actually uh, think, well, I guess everybody thinks about nuclear working still. But there used to be quite a few licenses that disallowed the use of software and, for example, nuclear controllers and uh, nuclear reactors or nuclear submarines or people who are using it to wage war and all sorts of stuff. Um, and so DFSG 6 uh, is basically the restrictions on fields of endeavor. And so as reprehensible as it is, illegally invading users' privacy is probably a field of endeavor that the uh, FBI and, well, probably the NSA in the U.S. Uh, currently does quite a bit of. Well, um, as far as I understood the clause, now it just says it's not allowed to make illegal invasions of the users' privacy, whereas FBI claims to make legal invasions. Um, so, and I really doubt a bit uh, that the DFSG uh, number six really say, uh, the events want to say, okay, you're not allowed to, to, to illegally use software. We can discuss about it, but of course, it's not okay to say you're not allowed to use the software to whatever, to build power plants. So that's not, not okay, but not, not, not to say you're not allowed to do illegal actions because right. you're out of scope anyways if you do illegal actions. The problem though is, of course, the question is, is which illegality are we talking about? Which legal system? So if you're living in a country, for example, that has a really... Uh, authoritarian government like the US, which wants to really control what its uh, people do, uh, then it may be much much things that you would actually consider doing are illegal. Uh, so I mean, even trivial works would be illegal. And it seems silly to have the copyright license revoked for something that normally you'd be civilly liable for or criminally liable. Well, there are a lot of silly things, but not all the silly things are forbidden by the DFSG. Oh, of course. But I'm saying that this is a case where DFSG section 6 explicitly states out and says that restricting fields of endeavor are, is not appropriate thing for the license to do. Well I, well, I still disagree, but I don't think that we will win anything if we continue this discussion, but in the end, I think it would be good to get rid of that clause anyways. Right, exactly. Yeah, the clause doesn't really gain anything for the license. So that was just one minor issue that I picked up. That was actually pretty straightforward. I just deleted it. Um, back on the previous slide, I'm a little bit confused because the uh, DFSG isn't a license itself. It's just a you know, set of guidelines about what licenses have, have to do. So how is it anti-no-nuke clause? Uh, okay, so the, the idea behind it was that there were specific licenses that were saying that you cannot use this software in a nuclear power plant, which is a, a very specific field of endeavor. Um, and so that's why I like to call it that, but it's just my... Oh, but it's actually, but that's actually both the DFSG and GPL3 would not allow that. Uh, well, so the GPL version 3 
So that's section six of the, or subpart six, or however you want to call it, of the DFSG that has this clause. Yeah. So the GPL doesn't say anything about uh, use of nuclear power plants or anything. Okay, but I, I guess I don't see this, I don't see the conflict. Between the no legal invasion of users' privacy and DFSG six? Uh, yeah, maybe I'm just missing something. Okay, yeah. Right, the DF, DFSG, uh stops people from having licenses that say you're not allowed to use this in a particular field of endeavor. That clause in the GPL is attempting to stop criminals using the G GPL code. That is a field of endeavor. So effectively we're saying we would like criminals to use Debian as much as anybody else. <laughs> So uh, another issue um, in the license is the anti-DMCA clause. So there's a clause in the license in section three that tells you that this work is not an effective method of copyright control or access control. Um, the idea behind that is to explicitly disclaim any attachment of the DMCA to a GPL version three work. So somebody can't come and tell you that, oh look, I've encrypted whatever I'm doing with GPL version three and then sue you under the DMCA because the license has told you that it's explicitly not uh, a DRM or a uh, effective means of encryption. I was wondering about this um, because it seems to me from a legal standpoint uh, that m merely saying uh, this thing which is quite clearly blue is not blue I, I'm not sure how that would stand up in court. <laughs> right, exactly, and that's one of the reasons why this clause is an issue, um, because a lot of people have pointed out that it's not clear that this clause is actually able to do what it attempts to do. Um, so, I mean, I don't really know whether it would actually be able to do. The other problem is, of course, a lot of countries don't have um, the DMCA, uh, so a lot of people are wondering, well, why do we need this stupid clause that doesn't have anything to do with our country, which is enlightened and doesn't have this silly uh, law? Um, and so a lot of people have been writing to say that it's a problem as well. I think the one uh, mollifying argument for it is that at the worst case, it becomes a null op. Uh, so I mean, it, it, it doesn't hurt you. It may help in specific cases. So I don't know. Uh, whether it actually will stay or not. I don't really have a strong opinion on it either way. I just know what the problems are with it. Hi, my name is Jimmy Kaplowitz. And uh, w one solution could be, instead of saying that this work doesn't meet the legal definition in the DMCA, it could be to say that um, the copyright holders granting this license uh, waive any rights to pr pursue legal action under, you know, under the charge of uh, an accusation of circumvention of uh, technological access measures or something along those lines. I, I don't know the right wording. Right, and I think, here, let me actually show the, what it says so you can kind of get an idea. Uh, I'm assuming my mouse is alive. Oops, it's not working. Well, unfortunately the sim links are all busted. I don't know. Well, I can't show it to you right now, but the idea behind it was that um, it was set up so that the copyright holders who were licensing the work and uh, the original distribution were saying that, yeah, this thing isn't really, uh, doesn't really qualify under the DMCA. So that was the intention, was to do exactly what you, what you mentioned. Um, if, whether it does it or not sufficiently, and whether it's clear or not, uh, it seems definitely clear that it's not clear enough because of all the comments that we've had about it. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that could be clarified. Yes, but I was suggesting if, if, if a legal, or if a statement that it does not meet the legal definition is unenforceable because a court might find that it does meet the legal definition, um, instead of phrasing it as a statement of fact, uh, you could phrase it as a waiver of rights to pursue such a claim, uh, which would m probably be more unambiguously enforceable. Yeah, 
That may be a good idea to add, even in addition to the statement of fact, is saying that, that yeah, I would suggest that you actually file a comment on that section. So it's section three, it's like a couple paragraphs down in section three. Yeah, there's actually one question from online, I guess. Uh, Thomas Martinson asks over IIC, if it actually does work legally to just explicitly state that your works are not on the DMCA, is that, will that hold up in a court? Uh, and that's really a question that I have no idea what the answer to because, of course, there's no case law that I'm aware of covering this exact issue um, in the U.S. So, um, yeah, an attorney would probably have to make a judgment call. And any attorney who tells you carte blanche one way or the other is lying. So you, you should get a odds on, on what the outcome is from them. Um, so, yeah. So, of course, the other problem, of course, is that all countries don't have the DMCA. And so that was just causing confusion. Well, any more questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, about, about other countries not having the DMCA, um, the way I see it is that it's, um, it's sort of missing the point to say, uh, in my country there is no DMCA, so why should I have to include this clause in my license? Because even if in your country there is no DMCA, um, there's no reason why you couldn't go to the US and sue somebody who's trying to interoperate with your software in the US. That, that's true, yeah. Edgar. Yeah, that, that was Edgar. Any more questions about this, uh, Enrico? Uh, another thing that I wonder is uh, if, because I mean, I know Stallman is in the US and in any case about the, the MCA, but there's like funky laws all around the world, so uh, that opens like if we do it for the United States, shouldn't we do it for like every other sick laws, wherever? Like uh, this software is not um, uh, an act of God under the law of the island of blah, uh, or this software is not. You don't have to put like a sticker from the Italian corporation of editors if you distribute this software because it's not a musical performance, I don't know. Uh, that comes like, strikes to me that there should, if you put that, then there should be like <laughs> a breakdown of, and, uh, and it would become fairly funky, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Um, it ki sounds kind of US-centric, and which makes me a bit bitter, but I could see it's useful, but uh, it's kind of a kind of worms. Matt has a question behind you too. Is it written in such a way that it explicitly spells out the DMCA, or is it written to say, you know, any law that tries to make these restrictions is, isn't covered? Because I know that Hollywood is trying to push, you know, and, and somebody mentioned uh, one going on in, in Europe that, you know, Hollywood is, is trying to push this into every country, and it might not be a bad idea to have a clause that protects about, you know, the general case. Yeah, it is actually um, a general case. It basically says that the work does not uh, constitute a effective means of access control or content control. Um, so it uses the language of the DMCA, but it doesn't refer to the DMCA. So it, it basically uses the clause of the DMCA and the wording of it to say that it's, it's not valid. As far as including more uh, countries with bad laws, I, I'm not sure if that's such a bad idea, actually, if there are countries with significant uh, free software presence and we need to route around laws that may be something that needs to be thought about more. A part of the thing with the US is that our problems dominate. Uh, I mean, everybody knows about every single little issue that the US has because we, we blast it out everywhere. Um, and so it, sometimes it's hard for people who are sitting inside the US to recognize and see the problems that other countries' legals uh, and other institutions' legal uh, issues have set up. So I mean, it's probably just a case that they weren't aware because they happen to be living in the US. Any additional questions about this particular clause? Uh, so my favorite clause, uh, so Mako and I have uh, argued quite a bit about this. We have very different ideas uh, as to what should be done about the ASP loophole. So the ASP loophole, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the application service provider uh, loophole. And so the idea behind this is that you could have an application service provider, for example, Google being a very popular application service provider, which provides an application 
which uses GPL to works, but the users of that application no longer have access to the source code. There's no way for them to deploy their modifications. And by use of the ASP model, they've effectively removed the ability of users to either control their data or to modify um, the source code, fix bugs, uh, enable the software to do things that they want to do. Um, so obviously, there are a bunch of ways that this can be dealt with. The current method that it's dealt with is that it's written as a restriction on modification. So they've basically imported the current wording of the Afro GPL wholesale into this clause. This is 7D. And it's written so that you must maintain functional facilities which enable a user of the work to obtain the complete corresponding source code. Um, and so obviously, that's a restriction on modification. So. Um, if, I'm, if I'm running a... Um, a, a um, name registry, like a domain registry, and I'm using a, I set up a website using Apache or other open source code to have a website that people can register their names, or even a hotel registration or something like that, I'm providing a service. Um, am I going to be expected to provide the source code for that reservation system just because I'm offering it as a service? I'm a little confused with this. So that's actually one of the major questions about this particular clause. So um, it's actually currently written as an additional restriction that can be put in. So its primary purpose was, of course, to allow explicit compatibility between the Afero GPL and GPL works, uh, because the Afero GPL was written in sort of close collaboration with the FSF, and there was always an assumption that they would be able to share works between each other. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I see. But I think, I think I can see both sides of the issue. Just consider the normal case what we have. We all run some sort of web server also, which is based on the software, even a lot of GPL software beyond it. Uh, and yeah, I'm having some things the user can download. Is it already enough to invoke that clause so that I need to offer everybody to download my kernel sources, for example? Which okay. would be, in my opinion, be in, uh, insane on the one side. On the other hand side, I see tendencies that are in Web to zero, as it's called, where you do some total applications only on the, via the web, like you do your web processor via the web. And then, of course, it's useful to say the users have access to the source code. So, I think that those are somewhere in between, and so it's possible to go wrong on both sides. Right, and, and that's currently one of the reasons why this clause is optional. So, it's set up so that you have to explicitly enable it by combining a GPL to work with the work that uses this clause or some in some other fashion turning on this clause. Yeah. Uh, just to get, this is probably a stupid question, but uh, if you've got a GPL config configuration file and you change the passwords in it, do you have to publish them? Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, my name is Philip Hans. If you've got a uh, Apache and the configuration files are GPL'd, except it's Apache, so that's a bad example, but yeah, you've got another uh, web server and the configuration files are GPL'd. When you change them, you've modified them, right? So you put a new password in, dot, dot, dot. What, is there an exception for that sort of thing? Yeah, there's not one is currently written, and again, that's one of the other issues that has been brought up in the, yeah, in the flame war on Debian Legal about the uh, Afero GPL and why it's not uh, DFSG compliant. Um, so yeah, so one of the problems, like for example, in really craptacular PHP scripts, you can actually put in the passwords in the script itself. Uh, a lot of them, for some reason, and seem to enjoy doing that. So of course, any time that you accidentally forget to, or accidentally on purpose or something, forget to load the PHP module, and somebody browses the website, uh, they get all your passwords, which is so wonderful. Um, so yeah, this is a an issue that has to be really thought out. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I've been going round and round about it. Uh, it's because I don't know of a good way to break the loophole and also um, stop the the evil sorts of uses of GPL works that restrict users' freedoms. I think about this. That, um, it's it's interesting to, to see where the line is. I quite like this clause generally because if I write a web application like that is obviously used by the user and it can only run on a server like a PHP application, there's no way I can enforce 
that users can actually get modified source code if they use it. But where does using stop? Like, is the user using my Apache, or is the user only using my, my PHP application, or is the user using the PHP engine? Um, is the user using my Linux kernel? Uh, so the, another complex thing is actually where to draw the line that you consider the user is using it, so it should have the source code, or the user is actually not using it, I am using it, so it's modification for my own personal use and I don't have to give it away unless I sell it or blah. Yeah, exactly, and in fact, in one of the fixes to this we were trying to think about is um, allowing the user to have non-private use, uh, i.e. performance or something, satisfy any of the parts of section six so that you didn't have a functional requirement for explicit an explicit functional module that had to download the source code. And no matter what you do, did, you couldn't remove that functional bit. Um, but it still gets back, we still get stuck in what's use and who's a user and when is use not private? When is it a performance? Um, and these are really difficult questions to answer in any sane amount of uh, text, and even worse, have it applicable to uh, most legal systems. It's quite difficult. Um, my name is Simon Law, and I was wondering how I was wondering how this particular clause differs from the existing section 2C of GPL v2, which is the interactive copyright and warranty display uh, restriction. So it basically says if the modified program normally reads commands interactively, when run, you must cause it to continue displaying this. And you're not allowed to remove this code. So what's the difference here in terms of objection? And so yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, one of my, I'm not entirely happy about 2C as well. Neither am I. Yeah, so uh, one of the mollifying aspects of 2C is at least it tells you what it has to provide. So it says, okay, it's okay to say that it's got copyright, it says that it has no warranty, and where the license can be found. It doesn't tell you that you have to keep it exactly the same way. It doesn't have to tell you that you even have to have it in English. It just has to have those things. So at least it has that mollifying aspect that, and it's also set up in such a way that it only triggers when it's run non-interactively in the most trivial way. Um, so that means you can easily disable it by putting in dot files and all sorts of environmental variables. So while it's an issue and it may be a strict DFSG compliance issue if we were to ignore clause 10, um, it, it's at least there are methods around it that don't make it as near a pain in the butt as it is with uh, the Afro clause as written. Um, Matt Zag um, do, does the passwords for like PHP scripts and whatnot like that, does that really differ from keys for DMR, uh, like GPL kernels and things like that? I mean, as long as you can uh, circumvent uh, the DRM and, and generate your own keys, I mean, that's similar to generating your own passwords. Um, has that issue been brought up? Yeah, I mean, that's actually an interesting point. The problem is that um, as currently written and most of the ways that these things are done, it basically just dumps out the source code uh, out of your web directory. Um, so, I mean, I'm not entirely sure whether it'd be easy to set up the work such that it can rip out the passwords. And since most PHP projects seem to be kind of one-offs, um, yeah, it's probably a little suboptimal for them. Uh, Margarita Manterola from Argentina. I don't know if you are familiar with the open source license, the OSL version 2, uh, but it looks like this Afro clause might make open source license compatible with GPL. I don't know if that's a fact. Yeah, I'm not actually sure with all the terms that are in the OSL license, um, so I can't really state. Go ahead. Um, next question about this is basically if you say user should attain the full rights to modify the software even if it's running in an ASP or by an ASP that basically means they need to have access to not only 
the software, but also to the other environmental stuff that runs there, which could be quite hard. So in the end, I fear if you couldn't get to any solution, that's something else than forbidding to use that software uh, at an ASP. Right. Well, so you're wondering whether or not the subsidiary things, like for example, if you wanted to run a copy of Google, like Google File System, would enable you to do uh, what it does. And yeah, and that's an important point. But that's the same issue that you have with GPL works that rely on different, uh, for example, GPL works that run only on Windows. I mean, they have dependencies that you can't get access to to modify. Um, so, or Java, yeah, for example. Uh, I guess Uh From purely legal standpoint, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been told that uh, copyright license cannot restrict use. It can only restrict distribution. So basically, can this clause even be uh, uh, in effect? And uh, it is, uh, from my point of view, we can only uh, talk about what uh, HTML code or JavaScript can be distributed to the client and what license that has. Right. and cannot uh, even touch the scripts that are running on the server. Yeah, and so one of the things and the way in this, which this is written is it's set up such that you can no longer actually remove this functional facility. And because, uh, at least in US copyright law, the preparation of a derivative work uh, is one of the rights reserved to a copyright holder, they can actually restrict you from making this kind of modification. Of course, I love to argue about it because I have the delusional uh, belief that private modification is sacrosanct. You should be able to take copyrighted work, and if you want to face it, burn it, it's your job. I mean, it's your work, uh, well, it's not your copyright, but it's your physical copy, you should be able to delete it. I mean, it should always be appropriate to, you know, if you don't like Windows, to delete it. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of, even though that's technically what the law says in the US, I'm not such a big fan of it. But of course, it wouldn't be the first time that I'm not a big fan of what the US law actually says. Well, now, I, I fear I'm, I, I have to play a bit the devil's advocate about the federal clause and just say, okay, what do we actually do? Um, usually we speak about what do we need if you distribute this code? If you distribute the binaries, you need to put the source on. If you distribute the source, you must allow everybody who gets the source to make certain actions with it, like modify, distribute, so basically have freedoms. And what this now is, is we are going via that uh, process of distributing and basically doing the same as uh, large um, music companies do. Say, okay, you can, get, you can buy this music CD, but only play it if you do this and that and that. And that's basically something that we consider very evil and very non-free. Right, exactly. And in fact, that's really my primary objection to this clause. I mean, I see the ASP loophole as a serious problem that we need to find some way of solving. Um, I almost wish that we wouldn't have to solve it, that users would learn that they're not safe using ASP models. They should figure out that these are not things that they really want to be using. Their data is locked up, they can't modify it, they should stop. But given the number of users who are still using Windows, a lot of them haven't got the message yet. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what to do. Uh, it's really trying to solve the problem. I don't know if it's the best way. I, I kind of think it isn't, but I haven't thought of a better way. And I've been thinking about this for, I don't know, probably two years now. So I, I still don't know a good way. We, we're moving forward, but it's still suboptimal. Yeah. Uh, just, just a slight clarification. Oh, my name is Peter Samuelson, by the way. Uh, to uh, what you were saying just a minute ago, um, copyright does actually allow you to restrict uh, certain uses. It's not just about distribution. Um, private use of copyrighted material is generally, I mean, I guess that's what you consider fair use and they can't really do much to you. But uh, public performance, which I know Donna's uh, talked a little bit about, and uh, certain other kinds of uh, public use uh, can be restricted by a copyright owner. This is why if you want to um, show a movie in your own home, uh, at least in the United States, you can, you, know, you can do that, but if you want to show a movie in public, you have to pay somebody extra money for it. You don't just have to buy the DVD. You also have to enter a license agreement with the copyright holder to uh, show it in public and probably share some of your profits with them and so forth. Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's getting at the performance question. So uh, Igers asked about if that was distribution, but it's really not just distribution. It's really the perf public performance aspect because you're not technically distributing a copy. Well, I mean, unless you think that 
having it burned into their retinas as a copy. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess if you're the uh, RIA, you know, your eardrums are a really important thing. Or <laughs> so. um, okay, any additional questions really quick? We've got about five minutes left. Let me see if I had any more slides that I want to talk. Oh, yeah. So one of the other things is the fact that patents are now an explicit grant. So it always was before that patents were set up as an implicit grant. Um, if you you basically had to give any rights that you had to end users. It's now been made explicit. There's a real clause that's saying that, hey, if you've got patents, you're explicitly granting them to end users. Um, the patent shielding I mentioned before, and the final thing, which I also talked about before, was limited patent reciprocity. Um, there are currently a lot of licenses that do ridiculous patent reciprocity clauses, um, and so those need to be basically rewritten. Um, a lot of them are written by people who have done a lot of license proliferation. Uh, and unfortunately, the uh, OSI is a little bit guilty of approving licenses that they should have not done, and they should have told the authors that, no, you don't need to write a new license. Go back, look at these other licenses which you should use instead. Uh, but that's something that they haven't done. Uh, so in conclusion, really quick, participate. Please read the license for yourself. See what it says. Think about it make comments about it on gplv3.fsf.org. The second thing, don't believe anything I've said. Find out for yourself what it says. Find out what it says in your own country. My country is not your country. I understand my country different from your country. Even if you live in the US, you have a different understanding of the US than I do. Okay, you live in different places. For example, very few of you actually live in California. I don't know if you're familiar, but states in the US all have slightly different laws. Okay, there's, in some cases, there's a unified code, there's federal code, but there's also state laws, and they're all slightly different. So if you know your state's laws, you should also be thinking about them. And the th final thing is do it soon. Okay? There's, the second draft is being written as we, well, the issues that are going to be taken into account into the second draft were due yesterday. The second draft will be being reviewed and being written in the next couple weeks. The second draft will come out uh, in a month or so. Then, once the second draft has come out, there will only be two more drafts, if that. So you need to get involved now to make sure that your contributions and the changes that you need to have made are made in the license, or at least properly addressed. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll be stuck with a GPL version 3 that you're not particularly happy with. Um, and so I don't want that to happen to any software developer here. I want you all to be able to willingly license your works GPL v2 or later, and later GPL v3 or later. So uh, please participate and make sure that the GPL v3 does what you need it to do. Any last minute questions, since I think we may have a couple more seconds? Uh, my name is Daniel Baumann. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I'm a bit familiar with Swiss law and the German law. Uh, I would like to precise what uh, Andy Bart says uh, at his first point, where he co has uh, talked about concerns uh, about um, the GPL is a license or a contract in the German law. Uh, in fact, it does not matter at all if it's a license or a contract for German law and for Swiss law. Uh, in most European countries, it's uh, also not important. Um, if you would like to read it from a lawyer, there is a book uh, from O'Reilly uh, written by the IFROSS. That's an institution of lawyers who takes care for uh, legal advice for open source projects. Uh, and this book is uh, uh, readable online on the O'Reilly website. And they state um, that uh, that's no difference for European law, especially German law, if a license, uh, if if a uh, if the GPL is a license or a contract because it's all the same. Only USA does uh, distinguish between them. Any additional questions in the closing moments? Oh. Um, more like a comment than a question. Um, well, I'm Edgar Rosera, and I am not a lawyer either. <laughs> um, but I have it from... Um, good authority that there might be a problem with the uh, uh, explicit granting of patents um, in Mexican law. Um, 
So my wife is an expert in intellectual property, and she's particularly studied Mexican and Canadian law. And uh, she was saying that apparently in Mexico, it, it is not valid according to patent law um, to to grant a, a patent um, that you don't already have. And there's something in the wording of the of the uh, draft for the version three where you grant um, all patents that you might eventually have and stuff like that, which could make it invalid under Mexican law. Of, of course, one of the mollifying aspects is that every time you do distribution, you're re-granting those rights. So as soon as you, you get a new patent, you do a distribution, you've now granted the rights to those patents. So I guess it's a continuous thing. So I suppose if you distributed, stopped distributing, and then got patents, it may be different. But then hopefully those patents only cover, there's prior art, hopefully, in the GPL to work. Um, so. so hopefully it won't be a big of an issue. There's one more question. Professor Berg, um, what about compatibility between version two and three of the GPL? Right, so as written, they're currently incompatible. Because there are additional restrictions that the GPL version three has that V2 does not. And that's one of the serious problems with licensing as the kernel has done, and in fact they've been told multiple times repeatedly that that's not something that was a wise idea uh, to license under V2 only. Um, so what's probably going to happen is hopefully people will eventually uh, clue in and start licensing stuff V2 or later. A lot of things actually in the kernel probably already are that way. Um, and so eventually we can transition to a more sane license that actually deals with some of the problems that we have now uh, as opposed to the problems that we had 10 or 15 years ago. Any last minute questions? Do we have any more time? Uh, Matt has one more. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, thank Don and the others in Debian who are uh, spending a lot of their time uh, representing the interests of Debian and, and free software and that we really appreciate that a lot. Thank you, thank you. So I'd also like to thank to all the members of the committees, the people who have commented, and also Debian Legal, uh, as flame-ridden as it may be, every now and then things come out of there that are pretty important. Uh, so they're actually there, even though you may disagree with them all the time, So, thank you. I'm um, done. We have one last minute question. I, I feel silly asking another question after all the applause, but um, does the GPL3 actually give you additional rights over the GPL2, or is it only restrictions? Um, so, the, it's a kind of a tricky question. So, um, it's definitely not less, it depends from the perspective. So if you're talking as a user, it gives the users more rights. Does it, is it more closer to the BSD license? No, it's not. Uh, no, I'm talking more about um, the perspective from the developer because if, if you make the license say GPL v2 or later, then basically you could, you can't change that anymore later, right? But right. you could lose some of your rights as a developer. Well, as a developer, though, you have rights to do whatever you want. So you can always take a work that you've licensed under V2 or later, say V3 or later, or sell it to Microsoft and say, hey, you can EULA it. But you can't do that retroactively. Well, yeah, once you open up the cat's bag, it's, it's out. Right. But since it's even more restrictive, there's, I mean, if it was less restrictive, there may be an issue, but since it's more restrictive, uh, and it's really preserving more user freedoms, I uh, really don't see why a distributor would have a problem with it. Of course, philosophical problems are something completely different.